I just started playing Limbus Company for the very first time, and I got to meet the community for the very first time as well. I had no idea. Uh, what were they calling themselves? Like the sleeper agents? I have no idea or had no idea that they even existed. So I was playing the game. Everyone in the community who came into my YouTube stream was extremely helpful, extremely helpful. But at the same time, they were so helpful. I had a lot of information thrown at me and my head was spinning. But I played the tutorial and uh, that did me zero good because I <laughs> read it. I tried it. I just didn't know what I was reading or trying. And at a certain point, I just started pressing the pretty colors and things just started happening. And then apparently there was a button that said win rate versus damage, I think. And I'm like, I don't know what these buttons do, but it makes things happen quicker. And that's pretty cool. But apparently that is like what you shouldn't do if you want to learn how to play the game. What I'm doing now, and I don't do a whole lot of these. Maybe I could in the future. I don't know. I'm I'm like barely a YouTuber at this point. Um, So I mostly just stream on Twitch and we just sometimes post YouTube videos. The point is, I'm going to watch this video from a guy called Yes, go is, is a goo. I'm not sure. I have no idea who he is, but he was recommended to me by a lot, a lot, a lot of people and said, Hey, just watch this because it's better than what the game gives you, apparently. So I'm gonna just film me learning this, and then if I miss something, you could put it in the comments. If I got it, you could say, Hey, you nailed it. You learn how to read. But apparently, another thing I'm learning about the Limbus Company community is. People don't read, which I also don't read. You know, whenever I read books in public, I'm clearly faking it. But regardless, we're in good company here. <laughs> Limbus. OK, listen, I'm 33. The dad jokes are pouring in. I can't fight it. My back hurts. Anyway, let's get into this. Let's see what I learned from the video and we'll go from there. So uh, if you guys uh, are watching along here, I appreciate it because I'm not sure how this is going to go. Anyway, let's do it. <laughs> As Limbus Company continues to improve in every aspect, be that story, ID animations, or basically anything else in the game, it begs an important question. What's that? Why is the tutorial still so bad? Hasn't this game been out for like two years, I think? Was it two years? I don't know. This isn't like a brand new game, right? Um, and you would think after like, if it is two years, duh, check my math on that. Um, you would think after like a year of getting feedback on it, they'd probably like just revamp some of the verbiage on there or something. But, you know, it's it's fine. Uh, we're, we're, we're learning. We're learning. Thanks to this guy, we're learning. I don't know. Well, as much as I wish I had an answer to that question, I don't. So I figured I would take it upon myself to finally <sighs> make a long awaited sequel to my first tutorial video from a few months ago. Oh, wait, that is this not the first one? Am I, am I watching the uh, wait? This is probably the 2.0 version. Oh, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna ride the wave here. I was sent this video from a buddy of mine, Reflex. Uh, he would not steer me wrong, so we're just we're gonna ride the wave here. And if this is the wrong wave, uh, sorry, Reflex, threw under the bus. My bad. Appreciate you. Mandatory to watch before this one, since it covers the basic rundown of Limbus Company's mechanics. Okay. Whereas this video will build upon that foundation and continue to elaborate on the very simple yet horribly explained mechanics of this game. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. This is the intermediate tutorial, which means I'll be talking about things that are still pretty essential for understanding Limbus, but nothing too niche or obscure. Okay, I need we that in my life. We aren't waiting in the kiddie pool anymore, but this also isn't even close to the deep end. I would okay. recommend at least having played all of Kanto 1 before watching this video. All right, we're cooked, boys. I played this tutorial. Uh, wait, is that Canto 1? That's not Canto 1. I, I, I don't even think I really got on the bus yet. We, we did a tutorial, and then we just... Uh, uh, what did we do? We gombaed. Yeah, that's what we did. That, that, was, that was the entirety of that stream. Should I still watch this? Eh, what's the worst that could happen, right? I'm sure we're fine. <laughs> so you are more familiar with the combat. But even if you are completely new, I have tried to make everything in this video as clear and accessible as possible. Okay, good. So, just like that first video, I'll be taking this tutorial in three segments. Bet. Number one, mm -hmm. speed, targeting, and skill slots. Okay. Two, status effects. And mm -hmm. three, team building. Okay. 
Also, like the previous tutorial, I will be unable to cover absolutely everything when it comes to these three topics, but the idea is to give enough of an overview that after these two videos, you can at least say I kind of sort of maybe understand Limbus Company now. That is really all I want at the end of this. I walked away from playing that the last time on my own, and I could not say I kind of understand Limbus Company now. I walked away saying that was terrible. Um, chat, please help me. And uh, that that is a good goal to have. That is a wonderful. You know what? I, I am glad people like him exist because I could never make something like this. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'm, this is good. Good video so far. Uh, he's making me feel like this is going to be a good time. I don't know. Maybe. God damn it! Oh my god, he said maybe. Oh, I'm cooked. I'm cooked, boys. I'm literally, I'm literally cooked. Oh my god. I, you know what? I overcommitted. I, I trusted him. I, I should have waited. There's always, there's always the red tape. You know. I'm sure we're fine. I'm sure we're fine. Just don't panic. Don't panic. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I would not let this game beat me mentally. Okay. Now, this first segment is something that probably should have been in the very first tutorial, but you can't really blame me because on a surface level, speed is a <clears throat> very simple mechanic. Yeah. Every ID has a speed range, which can be found by clicking slash tapping and holding on the ID in the center tab and looking down here. As okay. of making this video, the lowest speed range is 2 to 3, and the highest is 5 to 8, with an average okay. speed range being around the 4 to 6 or 3 to 7 mark. Okay. Every turn in combat, you roll a speed value within that ID's given speed range, assuming no modifiers, of course, and that value can be seen next to the ID's skill slots or on the bottom of the dashboard here. Speed can be used for multiple things, often conditionals on certain IDs, but the main thing is for redirecting clashes in combat. Okay, speed is not a guaranteed number, it's more of a guaranteed range, so it's all going to be RNG, but like if you have a better base and a better higher value, then your RNG is just better than a small unit who has lower RNG. I, I can get behind that. Okay, okay, all right, yeah, well, good start, good start. IDs with a higher speed value than the enemy can redirect attacks in focused encounters. Again, simple concept, but fundamental to understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speed matters far less in regular encounters since you can't manipulate your targeting nearly as much. Bro, I was wondering Going about that. Focused encounters, though, there's quite a bit more to talk about when it comes to redirecting. Okay, I was so confused Let's because I couldn't attack anybody. Let's say you're against this little up and coming sous chef. Sous Chef Bongi is ready to unleash his primal Bongi. Okay. Few things. What the hell is that? Second. Is that his butt crack open with teeth? Third. There really isn't much of a third because I can go on forever, but like that is terrifying, yet oddly kind of cute. The weird butt crack chicken. Um... It's a final boss, right? Yeah, okay. It's just... Blast, which has a base power of three quadrillion, a coin power of one, and infinite attack weight. Okay, this butt crack chicken needs to chill. Three, what is this, Dragon Ball? What kind of power does this thing have? What? Naturally, this attack is completely unclashable, and if you were to hit win rate, you would lose this battle, but lucky for you, Su Chef Bongi is on low HP and rolled a 1 on speed. Okay, so Since then the Primal Bongi Blast is the only skill being used by him this turn, we can redirect that skill so that the IG going last on our team, in this case, Base Hong Lu, would be clashing against it. But since everyone else on our team is faster than Bongi, he will be long dead before he can expedite the annihilation of the human race because we will hit him before <laughs> he hits us. Wait, so he can actually annihilate the human race, it's just he's too slow? This is canon? This is real? He actually is a final boss, he's just dumb. That's crazy, bro. Like, imagine if like there was a bug and his speed was just like ever so slightly bigger he would never be beaten. Like, wouldn't that be like some broken shit? Oh my god. This concept, which I call redirecting downwards, can be a lifesaver in fights where you can't just clash and win. The idea is to delay an enemy's attack until they are dead or staggered, but it will only work if you can do so before the enemy would use their attack. 
either due to being faster than your team or by reaching a skill that will clash against that attack. This is a pretty big part of why extremely slow IDs are less good than fast ones. Being outsped by an enemy means you have less control, and you can't just rush them down with all you've got in certain scenarios. Okay. But that's enough about speed and enemy target manipulation. Let's talk about other kinds of manipulation. Not like bad, how not I will bad. subtly manipulate you into subscribing by quickly shilling, or how you can manipulate the targeting of skills with attack weight. Uh, I know I'm reacting to the video, but also uh, like and subscribe to uh, his video and my video and support this guy because without him, there is no me understanding this game. So uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, so far, great video guy. I talked about this in my Railway 3 guide, but let me give a clearer explanation now. As I talked about in the first tutorial, which you definitely watched and fully remember to the point you could pass a high school level quiz on it, That's attack not true. weight is a representation of how many targets you can hit. Oh my god, I remember this shit. And it was something about like AoEs, and if like they had like a double quarter pounder with cheese a couple times, then your AoE won't go through them to the to the enemies behind them because they were they were eating salads and like if the weight's too much, then like it'll affect your your AoE or something like that, bro. I, I retained some of that shit, but I'm like, what are the thresholds? Like what if I just get a snack wrap? Does it matter if I get a snack wrap as opposed to a Big Mac or the Kai Sinat chicken Big Mac? Like, what are we talking about here? And I know he's gonna explain it to me, but like in the moment I read this while I was playing the game and I'm like, bruv, like we probably could have lived without this, but like I digress, here we are. In regular encounters, this will just hit whoever it can, really. Uh, there's no way I know of to change targets in human fights, but in focused encounters, attack weights quirks are revealed. Okay. Beyond the main target, also known as the target you drag the arrow to from the skill itself, extra attack weight will prioritize untargeted skill slots. This means that before you use an ego with attack weight, you can target every slot of an enemy that you don't want to hit with AoE, forcing the extra attack weight onto other body parts or enemies. Afterwards, you can then remove the arrows, just don't mess with the ego beyond that because that will reset the targeting. Tying nicely into this concept is slot weight, okay. which determines how much attack weight a skill slot takes up when targeted. Oh god, I'm already overwhelmed. Oh my god, I'm already overwhelmed. What are we talking about here, bro? I use the Big Mac analogy. God, I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. This is hard. Wait, wait, no pun intended because we're talking about weight, but like, hold on. Hold, hold, hold. You attack the one thing and then it spreads out to the you know what, I'm just, whatever, let's just keep riding the wave here, we'll figure it out. This is one by default, of course, but plenty of abnormalities or bigger boned individuals take up two slot weight instead. This okay. means that no matter what you do, a three attack weight ego would only be able to hit one other target, and so on for further amounts of attack weight. Okay, Speaking of transitioning I, oh wait, to I, the next topic, I think I got that. Slots, specifically game I think war. I got that. In regular encounters, up to 12 skill slots can be gained, and the order in which IDs gain them is determined <coughs> by the order you choose them in on the center select screen. The first selected ID will get a second skill slot first, and so on. So does that mean you want like your best unit to always be first? Because then they'll get that second skill slot first? Or do you want them last because I'm not sure if like that affects priority list or something like that? I don't know. Hmm. This will loop back around once every ID in battle has two slots. But regular encounters almost never last long enough to where it would ever loop around to give IDs three slots unless you bring in less than the maximum amount of IDs, but this is generally never worth it, in my opinion. Once again, focused encounters give us a far more interesting scenario to use this in. In focused encounters, extra skill slots are not gained by default if you bring in the max amount of sinners. You can view that max number instead as the maximum number of skill slots you can have in that encounter total. Okay. This means if you have an encounter that allows six sinners total, bringing in four sinners would give two of them two skill slots, based on who you selected first and second, and in that order. So on turn two, the sinner you selected first would have two skill slots, then turn three, and then turn the sinner three. you selected second would have two skill slots. I find that for a lot of newer okay. players, resources are often invested into only one or two IDs, which makes sense. But giving those IDs extra so... actions for the encounter can be the difference between struggling on a fight or absolutely dominating it. So what we're saying is, 
is literally what I was just trying to describe about having your best character go first. He literally predicted it and he uh, Doctor Strange the situation and knew that I was going to dump all my points into one person. So I shouldn't do that. Heard. That's good. This, this guy's good. Especially since this means sanity can be gained twice as fast, since you are taking double the amount of clashes. I would highly recommend taking advantage of this if you are struggling on any focused encounters, especially if they just so happen to allow an abnormal amount of sinners into battle. You can sacrifice some minimal turn 1 damage for long term benefits. Some IDs are much better candidates for second skill slots than others, and while that could be a video in its own right, I'll just put on screen some examples of IDs that are particularly good to double slot. With some reasoning that you might not fully understand yet, but anyone you have that is leveled and uptight highest is gonna be your best option. Okay. Okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, I got that, I got that. All right, we're, we're crushing it. Status effects are a topic I saw a lot of people asking about in the comments of the first tutorial, and I never really thought about it, but Limbus, once again, does not explain the fundamentals of a core gameplay mechanic very well. Don't have to sell me on that. That is literally the reason why I'm here right now, so preach, my guy, preach. I think at this point, there are far more poorly explained ones than well-explained ones. <laughs> there are seven main status effects. Burn, Bleed, Tremor, Rupture, Sinking, Poise, and Charge. Most IDs fall into one of these seven archetypes, so it's nice to know what each of them do, but first, let me talk about the universal mechanics for these statuses. First of all, every one of these statuses has potency and count. The potency is shown on the left side of the effect, and usually indicates how much damage will be dealt by the status, slash how strong it is. On the right is the count. This indicates how many times the status can be triggered before falling off. Jesus. For example, let's look at burn. What is this that is thing? This is a damaging stat Bro, what the hell even was that enemy? Hold on. What What even? This looks like some crazy demonic final boss. And it can hit for like 10, 7 times? Are you kidding me, bro? Oh my god, my guy. I'm going to have to like... Oh my god. I know I'm not there yet, but like... Man, I'm gonna have to build these characters like God tier, bro. That's oh, I'm nervous. I, I'm like already thinking about how my life's about to be hard down the road. Looking at this, like, yeah, I'm looking at the numbers, but like, I'm looking at also the creepy looking Mr. Krabs claw hand lady. Like, man, all right, that's fine. That's future me's problem. Image will be dealt by the status slash how strong it is. On the right is the count. This indicates how many times the status can be triggered before falling off. For example, let's look at Burn. This is a damaging status, and it deals damage on turn end by the potency, then lowers the count by one. This is the simplest damaging okay. status to understand, since if Burn potency is at 46, that's right, 46 damage would happen at turn end, and then the count would be reduced by one. Bleed isn't quite as simple, oh. but it is another damaging status that uses potency and count, but it triggers whenever a full clash occurs, or also known as whenever a coin is broken on either side or a tie happens, a or coin? whenever a coin is rolled in an actual attack. What the hell is a coin, bro? I'm sure he'll talk about it, right? Right? Yeah, we'll find out. Just like burn, the bleed potency indicates the amount of damage that will be dealt, and the count will be how many times it can trigger before falling off. Tremor is certainly a more unique <coughs> status, since it doesn't do any damage. Instead, Tremor relies on Tremor Burst, a separate effect that often goes hand in hand with Tremor. When tre As if the game couldn't get any more complicated. Like, you have Tremor, it doesn't do anything, but if you have Tremor Burst, then it does something. It's like, why couldn't you just make it all one thing? Like, I swear, I've played other gacha games before. This right now has been the most complex game that I've played in this genre of games literally ever and sometimes it feels like there's no reason for the amount of complication behind it other than why not um but i'm riding the wave i'm, I'm riding the wave it's just a lot to take in and i'm just trying not get super overwhelmed but we're 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 putting it together it's fine it's fine tremor is bursted the target's nearest stagger threshold is raised by the tremor potency 
Stagger thresholds are a whole other rabbit hole, but thankfully they're pretty simple to give an overview on. Let's say we had an enemy with 100 HP flat. Almost every single enemy in the game has at least one stagger threshold, and when their HP is equal to or below the stagger threshold, they become staggered. So with this enemy here, their stagger threshold is at 80 health. So if we were to have 24 Tremor on the opponent and then burst it, they would immediately be staggered regardless of damage dealt, since the stagger threshold is raised up to 104, and their HP is then lower than the stagger threshold. Tremor's count also reduces by 1 at the end of every turn, just like Burn does, and no, bursting Tremor does not innately reduce the Tremor count. The so the stagger has to go over the HP value to stagger it, I think. Okay. So that is a common misconception. <laughs> okay. Rupture and sinking are both pretty similar in their <laughs> function. Rupture is a damaging status, and sinking is a hybrid between a damaging status and a debuff. Rupture simply deals damage by its potency whenever the target is hit, then reduces count by one. Sinking is a little bit more complicated since it has two different modes. What even is sinking, bro? The first mode is against enemies with sanity, where sinking will deal sanity damage by its potency on hit, then reduce count by one. This is the debuff mode I mentioned, but on enemies without sanity, usually abnormalities, sinking deals gloom damage by its potency on hit, <sighs> then reduces count by one all the same. What is gloom, bro? What is happening? Okay. Wow. We just like making up debuffs now at this point, aren't we? That's crazy. Okay. Okay. We're mm, okay. Sinking and gloom if they have no sanity. Okay. Okay. This means rupture deals true damage, unaffected by damage type or sin resistances, but sinking, while it can deal less damage, can also deal up to two times more damage if the target is particularly weak to gloom. Then we have okay. Poise and Charge. Okay. These stand out as different from the other five statuses. Of course they, they do. they are non-damaging, like Tremor, and they are even stranger because they are not inflicted, but rather gained. Poise first. And this status effect allows you to deal critical damage at a 5% chance per Poise potency. Oh, that's kind of cool. This means at 20 Poise potency, every single hit you do will be a critical hit. Oh, that's actually kind of dope. Well, okay. What does a critical hit do? Yeah. Well, going I by trend sure. video games, you might think it's something like 2 times damage. Yeah. 1.5 times damage. Makes sense to me. But in Limbus, a critical hit is only 20% more damage than a normal hit. Poise count is reduced every time a critical hit is landed, and is also reduced by one on turn end, like burn or tremor. So no matter, I can have 100% crit, and it's only going to do 1.5 damage no matter what. Okay, I mean, the numbers will still go up, so that'll be kind of nice. Yeah, we'll take it. Despite the low damage bonus, this is the best status to run overall if you're depressed, because it makes a really nice noise whenever you crit, so always be sure to run poise whenever possible in order to fill your daily dose of dopamine. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely put that in the underwhelming threshold for sure. I was kind of hoping it'd give me a bigger number, you know, bigger number, better person, better gamer. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I will get that daily dose of dopamine because the number is a little bit bigger than it would have been. And if I get an awesome sound effect, then, then you know what? I I'm a sucker for a good sound effect. That's fine. I'm back in. Charge is the last main status effect to talk about and is the most different by far. Not only is it gained instead of inflicted, but as of this video, charge potency can't be gained. Outside of the initial <laughs> one... <laughs> What the f <laughs> God. Okay. God. It, it, I was like, you know what? I'm getting into a groove. This is good. They can gain charge, but they now can't gain charge. I'm like, okay. Okay. On potency that comes alongside gaining count, since you can't have a zero on either the potency or count for any of these statuses. Instead, charge is just count. And what's more, charge count does nothing. God. Damn it, dude. Oh, why is it a thing? Why is it a thing? Why does it exist? Why are you put on this planet just to suffer? Oh my god. Okay. Charge is just a number, and it is usually spent by IDs that have charge in their kit for some kind of benefit. Or you must have a certain amount of charge stored up for certain effects to occur. This is a very case-by-case -case status, 
but it is by far the most basic because it is just a number that goes up and down. Okay. So those That's are the fine. main statuses, but there are so god damn many status effects that I am sure I was unable to scroll through all of them even though I am intentionally talking slower in this part of the video so that I can show off as many of them as possible on screen. Bro, I'm cooked, bro. I'm cooked. I got overwhelmed on seven, bro. No shot. Oh, man. I got my work cut out for me, bro. I'm never going to figure this out. Oh, wow. That's... <sighs> this game is something else, huh? Yeah, this game is something else. Bro, there are so many. They forgot to render a freaking image for this one. Are you kidding me, bro? Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sick. Yeah, that was probably not even half of them. None... It wasn't even, oh, oh, God, my heart just hurt. It wasn't from the coffee stopping my freaking heart. Uh, I thought I was going to feel better after this video, but we're about halfway through, and um, I'm, I'm, I do feel a little better. But I also now can see the entirety of the forest, and um, it's a lot. It, it's a lot, guys of the non-core status effects have count, and instead only have potency, or a value, and just go away whenever the turn ends. Some of the actually important ones to know are Paralyze, Fragile, Haste slash Bind, and Aggro. Paralyze reduces coin power to zero, and affects as many coins as the potency. This status, as I mentioned, only lasts for one turn, so Leftover Paralyze would not carry over to the next turn, unlike all of the main statuses which would. Fragile increases damage taken by 10% per stack, which is useful for dealing more damage. <laughs> Once again, my insightful commentary is truly unmatched. Haste increases your speed by the value for a turn, Bind decreases speed by the value, and Aggro is really odd. I made a video a uh, while ago where I tried my best to explain Aggro, but frankly, even that is borderline speculation. Oh my god, Aggro that's is a crazy. Special status effect that is gained upon using skills generally found on tanky IDs. In focused encounters, IDs with aggro are meant to be targeted more often, and while that can certainly be the case, it's common knowledge that this is a very inconsistent status effect. It feels like and placebo is crazy. Four, but I felt it was worth mentioning since it is quite prevalent. I can't really give you more specific stats than that, since I would just be guessing at that point, but that is the general gist of what it should Wow, do. that's interesting. I really could okay. go on and on about status effects, but my biggest advice is to just read them. Even if it's just at a glance, since some of them are very important to general gameplay, and especially some notable fights that you might get stuck on otherwise. Um, one thing I did, again, to reiterate, like I did in the beginning of this video, it is a well-known thing that apparently the community is illiterate. Their words, not mine. So him saying, just read, bro, that's a tall order, from what I understand, you know, uh, and, and <laughs> playing the game for a little bit, they were using a lot of big words, they were using a lot of big words, and I'm like, bro, you could have just tighten that up a little bit to like a fifth grade level but it's fine um so is the community cooked i don't i don't know like i'm cooked we're cooked we're all cooked it's fine it's fine now this is a big one team building and while i could once again make a whole detailed video explaining the ins and outs and ups and downs in short there's no one size fits all advice here Limbus is hmm. easy enough for at least the first three cantos to use whatever ragtag team of ragtag IDs you have and still win pretty handily. Okay, Especially good. if you remember that you can double slot IDs if you need. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. in general, makes a good team? Again, this is dependent on what you want, and in my opinion, there's roughly three team archetypes. One, a status team. Two, an ego team. Or three the strongest shit you could find. Hey, Since that's my you know team right there, baby. Are, a status team is self-explanatory. You build around making one of those main status effects work. The issue is that most of these statuses will require at least four IDs with good synergy for that status, and often will recommend having at least one specific non-base ego. If you're a new player, I would not recommend going all in on a status team unless luck just so happens to favor you and give you a whole bunch of IDs for one archetype. Nope. And, of course, 
you enjoy it. Yep, that if wasn't me. If you are insistent on building a status, poise is the easiest by far in the current state of the game due to the massive amount of poise IDs, and statuses you gain instead of inflict are always going to be less tricky due to less RNG factors <laughs> being involved. The fire was kind of usable, and then... Wait, what did it say? Uh, fire, fire is kind of usable, and um the what is that tremor literally worthless i'm dead bro <laughs> it's tricky due to less rng factors being involved the one i would least recommend has to be bleed since it has very specific id requirements for a very shaky payoff on the other hand Ego teams are much more general and reliable in their usage okay these are teams you build in order to fuel ego whether that be multiple, just one, or even every single ego you have access to on that team. Okay. Starting out, you will only have the 12 base ego, and these are the cheapest, costing either 4 resources or 6 resources. However, to use an example, I think the most effective base ego to build around, if any, is Merceau's Chains of Others. Even if your Merceau is unleveled and unloved, he can find some <laughs> amount of value from using this Ego, which is a strong debuffing tool that heavily nerfs the opponent's Bind, rolls and oh, speed okay. at the following Debuffer. turn, nice. while also doing the same to you. Chains of Others costs 2 Envy, 1 Sloth, and 1 Gloom. If you wanted to fuel this every turn, it would be best to have a focus on Envy, with plenty of Sloth and Gloom as well, obviously. The good thing about the base Ego is that cheap cost. You won't need Chains of Others every turn, not even in the toughest of boss battles, but it's still good to be conscious of the ego resources you need in order to fuel the ego you wish to use. The issue with building a team like this is if you would have to use subpar IDs in order to fuel the egos well, and if you ask me, this is generally just not worth it. However, when acquiring new IDs, the Sin affinities they give you access to are definitely worth noting, and some Ego can be worth building a whole team around, even with some suboptimal choices. Fluid Sack, Sun Shower, and really any good healing Ego can justify a hard focus, but still, that's only if you actually need their benefits, mm -hmm. whether that be high <clears throat> attack weight or the healing. But still, okay. in general, prefer strong IDs over convenient sin affinities. And speaking of that, strong the classic IDs. strategy, okay. just use the strongest IDs. Uh, that's, this However, is going to be my strategy right here. Strong might still not be entirely clear to you at this Bro, point. Bro, how is that a gray area? For general area. purposes, the biggest things you want to look at are the amount of coins and the numbers. I hate to say it, but 9 times out of 10, the effects are usually third in importance to raw damage, with the exception of certain status teams and some specific conditionals on specific skills. Mm -hmm. As discussed in the first tutorial, more coins means more hits means more damage, and higher clashing slash higher offense level means better odds to get the damage off and not take any damage back, as well as easier ways to get sanity. Okay, so I'm definitely going to go Team Unga Bunga for sure, especially in the beginning. Um, it seems like with his description here, having a stat effect team is probably not... I mean, unless you have like a god tier stat effect team, it's probably just not the move ever, I would argue. As opposed to real good Unga Bunga while like touching into some stat stuff maybe. And then I don't know. Like, is there a way to just mix all three and call it together and, and call it call it a day? Not call it call it together. Whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's options here. There, there's options. Okay, but I do think what I'm gonna end up doing is this right here with the strong IDs. Uh, because also I think I did like a twenty pool and then I ran out of pools. So you know I don't have a lot of options. But I digress. Also, we still have to do the first actual stage or the first world or whatever the hell they call it the kanto is the kanto region is this a pokemon reference um yeah we'll see what happens once we kind of like get into that and i heard that the game is very generous with pools so hopefully we'll get enough pools to get some pretty decent characters and then kind of just go from there really there are a million tier lists out there and I while they will that. all tell you various things, these are the fundamentals, and I cannot recommend enough that you come to your own conclusions based on them, rather than just foaming at the mouth for an ID strength tier list from some random person on the internet, which will probably include me soon, but that's not relevant. Are there actual, like, valid tier lists, or is everyone just kind of, like, farming engagement, basically, to just... 
be like, oh, no, it's this person. No, it's this person. Because, I mean, in other gacha games, there are, like, meta-relevant characters, but it changes by, like, the banner, basically. So the newest banner has the most broken character. Oh, there's a new one coming out, so they're the most broken. It's, like, a consistent, like, team that's just always been the best. Like, I don't... I mean, I'm sure I'll learn that, but that's, like, down the road, but I'm just genuinely curious at this point. Even on a team of the strongest IDs, it is important to fuel at least a few ego, which should just happen by chance, but it is worth checking to be sure. Mm -hmm. This tab on the side of the Sinner Select screen shows you the amount of a Sin resource you have on your team total. It shows this using a skill 1 as 3 of a resource, skill 2 as 2 resources, and a skill 3 as 1. And the amount needed for your equipped ego total on the right. Don't okay. get it wrong though. Having a bunch of a certain resource can be a good thing, and better than a wide sin spread. If you just plan to spam one or two ego that cost a lot of those resources, or in fringe cases, only costs that one resource, then that's just better. Ultimately though, the oh, best team building advice I can give is to not worry about it too much until you start struggling or reach just around Kanto 4. At that point, you should have acquired enough IDs and some ego, whether that be from gambling your life away or from the battle pass. I think I'm going to gamble my life away based on whatever the game gives me in currency. Also, Kanto 4 is that like where shit kind of gets real? Kanto 1 through 3 I should be chilling with? Oh boy, I got my work cut out for me. Okay. Once you actually have an ego or ID you wish to build around, that's when you can start to theorycraft. Since when your options are so limited near the beginning of the game, there's just not much to be done, and there's not much to be said. Okay. And that concludes the intermediate tutorial. And all basically, right. nice. all of the essentials to be able to understand Limbus at <clears throat> large. Since you reach this point, you're likely either a very confused or a very invested new player, and if you want more videos discussing Limbus's mechanics, you now have the knowledge to understand almost every video on my channel, and some of them dive deeper mm. into the mechanics I somewhat glossed over here. Yeah, a little column A, little column B, as my one buddy says. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very confused and brain dead. Like, the picture that was, like, right over here. Uh, where are we at here? Yeah, right, right here. This, this is me. This, this is me. I, I, I am brain empty here. Um, but I am also over there as well, and I'm down to you know figure this out a little bit. So we'll see how that plays out. Deeper into the mechanics, I somewhat glossed over here. In particular, I think these two videos are good stepping stones, talking about the in-game mechanic of conditionals and the more meta idea of opportunity cost. Meta! I don't mean to shield these for no reason, I just genuinely believe that they are useful resources, especially since I don't think I'll be making an advanced tutorial for this game anytime <laughs> too soon. Oh, really? Okay. But hmm. with that, thank you for watching. Cool. Hopefully everything in this video made sense, and if it didn't, I am once again sure that people would be willing to answer any questions in the comment section if you happen to have them. True. Um, so, again, this dude made a really, really good video. I think everyone was 100% spot on. I genuinely, unironically, I genuinely learned a lot from this video. Um, so, I'll be playing this game moving forward. Uh, I stream on Twitch and on YouTube, so if you guys miss it, just catch the VODs or whatever. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be more than enough people who want to help me out with this, and I am open to the help. So there's a lot to get into. There's a lot of story that I'm trying, looking to dive into because it seems kind of like dark slash cool and fun and weird and i'm a manager but my head's a clock but like i don't i don't know there's there's a lot going on either way thank you for everyone who recommended me this video i really really enjoyed it i think i did learn a lot even though my brain is a 1000 percent empty and um i guess once i jump into my next playthrough on this game uh, we'll see what i actually retained and what i didn't retain so uh i don't know so uh, cliche youtube like and subscribe stuff and uh, i'll see you guys later and you uh have a good rest of your day see ya